Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the very first episode of the Marco San Podcast, the MGP, the show where I bring on some of the most talented and successful people from the nation's capital here in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And we kind of hear about their success story, how they came up, what brought them to be as successful as they are today. And most importantly, we're going to be tackling a different subject every single week that I think that specific guest is the best person to talk about. And if you ever think of anyone you want me to bring on the show and interview, if you ever think of any topics that you would be interested in us discussing on the show, drop it in the comments below. Let me know and I'll do my best to get that person on the show or to bring up that topic and talk about it. Today, we're going to be talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and its effect on the Ottawa real estate market. And I have the pleasure of bringing on someone that is a top producing real estate agent in the Ottawa area with almost five years of experience and literally producing at a high level almost every single year he's been in the business. Um, this is someone I work personally with um, on their team. And this is one of the best teams in Ottawa. And today we have the pleasure of bringing on Matt Gibbs who is the team leader, one of the two team leaders for the Mayu Gibbs property group here in Ottawa, and also co-owner of the newest Century 21 brokerage here in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. This guy knows everything about real estate, and we are honestly honored to have him on today. So without further ado, let's throw Matt Gibbs on this thing, and let's talk about the real estate market in Ottawa and how it's going to be affected or is currently being affected with this pandemic happening. So let's dive right into this. All right, we got Mr. Gibbs here on the show. Matt, thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be on here with us today. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm good. How That's, about you? I'm doing good, man. Surviving, you know? I love how you got the basketball net set up on the back of the door there. Absolutely. You got to have you gotta, it. Got to relieve that stress every once in a while. There you go. You know, when you get, when your brain's not functioning, you shoot some hoops and, and you're back into it. Shoot some hoops, buddy. I, I've been wanting to get a basketball net for years just so I can get back out there and shoot some hoops. You have to, man. It makes a big difference. Yeah. All right, Matt Gibbs. So let's start here. For for those of the viewers that don't know who Matt Gibbs is, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you got to the point you are today? Um, well, I, I, I mean, I started back in real estate in May of... 2015 so I'm coming up on uh, in, in two weeks actually I'll be coming up on my fifth year fifth full year in, in real estate uh, before that I was a uh, I worked at Canada Post for about 12 years uh, had a lot of experience in uh, managing some of their call centers um, uh, helping with managing other call centers helping with uh, being a part of their, 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 their overpayment team, collecting for overpaid employees uh, when we had a deficit of uh, $27 million. Uh, so, you know, I've got, a, I've got an extensive background in, 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 in management, um, but, you know, that, that it just wasn't for me. Um, and then uh, I, I fell into real estate. I felt like it was something I was really passionate about. Um, I, I thought that, uh, it was something that I could really exploit and use uh, my uh, my skills, my people skills in communicating with people. Um, I did a little bit of construction when I was younger. I've always had uh, an act um, and the want to uh, do certain uh, renovations on myself or on the house, that sort of thing. And I'm a stickler for detail. You know, you know. Yeah. Right. So uh, I'm a stickler for detail. I hold people at, uh, uh, or I try to hold people at a high level of accountability. And and and, uh, and and you know what? It's worked so far. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be. I'll be honest with you. It wasn't. It wasn't something like everybody thinks. Like everybody thinks that they could be a realtor. Everybody thinks that diving into this business is going to change their lives. Um, one thing I will say is I was. I was guilty of that. I was guilty of being that guy who thought, Hey, why not real estate? Hey, why not? Let's, let's be a millionaire overnight. Um, <laughs> as you know, uh, now Mark, you know, almost two years now for you. Yeah. Come, that's actually one full year now. One full year. Yeah. I think it was, uh, 
a week and a half ago was my one year anniversary. Wow. Congratulations, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Uh, Thanks. That, that's, you've come a long way in the one year that, uh, that we've been working together. So, um, but as you know, you know, you, you were, you were guilty of it yourself. Yep. I think we're all guilty of it to a certain extent of, of people who have, who've gotten into real estate thinking that, you know, it's going to change their life overnight, uh, in a positive way. And, um, it's we, the opposite. We, we do feel like, you know, things are just going to fall on our lap. People are going to, um, now that we're an agent, people are just going to reach out to us for advice. That's not the case. Um, you've got to show your worth. You've got to prove to people uh, that you're you're knowledgeable about the industry, uh, that you're knowledgeable about the market, uh, and that you have certain skills to sh- demonstrate value um, and, and and get people moving in the right direction. Uh, so that takes time, uh, and that's not something that you can fast track. You need to you need to learn it. You need to learn it right, uh, and then once you've once you've mastered that skill, um, you'll start to the dividends will start to pay off, right? Um, I was big when I first got into real estate. Uh, I worked with a with a team that was, uh, you know, I consider I consider them uh, I considered them to be an extremely successful team. They did, uh, you know, 150 to 160 transactions a year at the time. Um, and uh, I, I, I just, I joined that team so that I could just soak up all of the, their, their knowledge of the industry, their knowledge of how they became to be successful realtors. Um, but none, nobody uh, that I know that is accessible, that's a successful realtor today uh, started out that way. Everybody has had their own trials and tribulations. In order to get to a certain point, um, and nobody's nobody's gotten a free pass. Yeah. So I kind of told the viewers already that you're you're a top performer. So if you if you want to just put that into numbers for them, how many transactions would you say you do in a year? Um, I think last year I did about 60, 65 transactions. Uh, it was by far uh, my best year. That's crazy. Um, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. Like I keep on coming back to that. And I know I've said that to you a thousand times and, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe the viewers don't know this about me, but it was, it was a struggle. Uh, my first year in real estate, I did, I did, uh, I did a gross commission of $10,000. Yeah. Talk uh, about that a little bit. I know you have a pretty unique story and how it went down. Well, when I first got into real estate, uh, my wife was pregnant at the time. Um, I was putting in probably close to, uh, depending on the day, anywhere between 10 to 14 hours worth of work. Um, mm. And I, I expected to see that, uh, that, that, that work pay off. And that just, it just wasn't the case. Um, but, you know, and that's, I think that's where a lot of agents in this industry fall short. Is they, they, you know, they think that they can put in just a regular eight-hour day and you know they're going to start seeing results from that right away um as you know mark uh we don't we don't have a salary uh we are 100 percent commission based and even when we do a sale uh the majority of the time that we do a sale we're not seeing that paycheck for anywhere between you know on average probably two to six months yeah so that's a long time after uh you've completed a transaction to actually get paid for it so, you know, I'm a big believer in building the pipeline, um, you know, uh, spending, you know, f- a few hours on the phone every single day uh, and prospecting, uh, calling friends, calling family, uh, calling past clients, uh, calling, uh, you know, calling current leads that you're receiving on listings or online lead generation platforms that you're using. Uh, but it's a full contact sport. If you're not making those phone calls and and, and, and then you're not going to, you're not going to get anywhere. You know, if you're not making those, putting in those three to four hours a day of prospecting. And when I say prospecting, I'm not talking about necessarily having to call everyone every day because in this day and age, people don't want to talk to you. The reality of the situation is people, people, people are scared to, to be sold anything. Yep. Right. That's a hundred percent true. Um, that means that you've got to come up with unique, different ways in order to grab people's attention and that's 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 providing value 
So, you know, I, 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 whatever works for people, and, and what I mean is the consumer. So whatever works for the consumer, you need to be doing that. So if that's, uh, and we all react differently to certain situations, right? But the human nature is, I don't want to talk to you, Mark, right? Yeah. I, I want information about something without talking to you. So how do we get that to them? That's the challenge. The challenge is how do we uh, reach people and give them the information that they're looking for, but not all of the information that they're looking for. So they're asking for more. And that's, that's a hard line. That's a hard line to follow. And that's a, that's a hard thing to find because each prospect, uh, as you know, is going to have a, a different unique situation, uh, a unique life situation that they're currently living. So, you know, I'm talking about making the phone calls, sending out the texts, sending out emails, um, sending out video now. Video is big in this day and age. It's something that I'm guilty of that I don't do enough of. And it's something that I would like to do more. Especially uh, during these times, eh? It's kind of, it's shifting the way the industry and, operates. And, this, and these times, are, 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 it's, it's showing us that video is an extremely powerful tool. So now what I find is, has been working really, really well. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be seven weeks that I've, been, that I've been home. So seven weeks ago, we went to pick up our, our kids from daycare and they said, you're not coming back. And you're not coming back for two weeks. And two weeks is now turned into seven weeks. So with having a four and a three-year-old at home, um, the struggle has been, how do I still go to my appointments? How do I still list properties? How do I still talk to people about listing their home? How do I still convince people that now's a good time to put their home on the market? Yeah. Right. Without, and, and, and the reality is, is that I haven't been able to go to these appointments. I haven't been able to, you know, go into their home and get a face to face with them. So video has been, uh, been huge in, in this market. Um, and I, I foresee the, the, the industry changing somewhat once this pandemic is all over. Um, it'll, I, I see it changing for the better, to be honest with you. We have all these tools like Zoom, FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp. I mean, we, we, as, we, we as agents need to be using these tools to, to, to help our clients. Uh, I think what's been, what's been somewhat uh, good about this right now is everybody's on the same page. Nobody wants you in their house, mm -hmm. right? So now it's okay i want you to do me x y and z mr and mrs seller uh i want you to send me 30 pictures of your home uh we're gonna set up a time of when we're gonna do our video conference chat uh i'll go over our listing presentation and i set the agenda for our call right I want to review the pictures with you i want to know which room is it that i'm looking at from certain pictures uh, and then I'll, I have, uh, like we have, uh, uh, for our team, we have a listing checklist. So when we're in the home, um, you know, we're constantly taking notes about the property so that when it comes time to list the property, we've got everything that we need. So yeah. that can be done as well virtually. You know, I just run through that checklist. Okay, what kind of foundation do you have? What kind of, you know, how old is your roof, windows, and furnace? Okay, does it... Does it, uh, you know, does it smell like animals in the home? Do you smoke in the home? Uh, you know, the different cultures uh, have different spices that they use to cook with. Uh, and some of those spices can stick around a while, as you know. So, you know, it's important that you ask the appropriate questions in order to determine uh, where you, you, you see the property fit in terms of uh, an actual list and a sale price, right? So I feel like the video has been a very uh, great tool for us to utilize, especially during, during, during these uncertain times um, for the people who, who, who need to sell their house. Because here's the, here's the thing. Um, people, people think that, oh, well, there's, there's no more homes coming on the market because of the pandemic. That's, that's wrong. Uh, you know, and, and people think, well, because of this pandemic, we should wait. That's wrong. Right? And, people and, still and, need to buy and sell. People still need to buy and sell. Um, divorces are at an all-time high. Uh, you know, living under the same roof with someone that you can no longer live under the same roof with, 
uh, you, you, you got to find ways to still liquidate your property and, and, and net as much money as you possibly can. Uh, the, I think the biggest challenge that we're seeing right now uh, is, is no doubt is, is tenanted properties. Yeah. You know, tenanted properties where the landlord is looking to capitalize on their investment and take advantage of, of a really strong seller's market. Uh, and then, you know, we're, we're faced with the challenge of uh, the tenants have all the power and the tenants are no longer letting people um, into the home for showings and viewings. Uh, and, or we, had, you know, we just recently went through one, one sale in particular where we, we sold the property pre COVID, uh, sold the property for $20,000 over asking price. Um, and now the tenants are refusing to leave. So you know, what so would you tell, is there anything that you can recommend to landlords? Is there any way around this or they got to just got to suck it up and, and deal well, with it? I, I think right now, I think you gotta, you, you, it really depends on your tenant. Okay, so if you've got a great standing relationship with your tenant, I mean, the landlords are going to know, are they going to, they're going to know their tenants the best. So, you know, when you're talking to a landlord, you need to be asking questions like, okay, well, what kind of a relationship do you have with your tenant? Is it a rocky relationship? Is it a fantastic relationship? And what I mean by that is, do you have problems with your tenant in terms of them paying you on time? Do you have problems with your tenant in terms of getting old of them? Do you, when you do talk to your tenant, how does that conversation go? Because that's really going to tell me how easy it's going to be for us and our team in terms of how to liquidate your property. Are we going to have a hard time gaining access to the property? You know, because, you know, you, you and I both know that just because we provide a tenant with 24 hours notice does not mean that we're going to have an easy time gaining access to the property. Exactly. So a lot of the times these people are staying in the home, even when, uh, even when they're not supposed to be, and they're just they just make things difficult. So uh, you know they'll give they'll give potential buyers the stink eye, or they'll say something uh, detrimental about the property. They'll they'll talk about how it's in a bad location, or you know how the landlord is a terrible person, or you know these are all things that will interfere with the sale of the home. So yeah. I think that's our biggest challenge right now in this market is not necessarily moving properties. It's moving properties that are tenant occupied. And what about buyers? What would you say to buyers that are looking to buy or need to buy in during this pandemic happening? Um, is it a good time to buy? Is it a bad time to buy and why? Well, it's kind of the same thing with, with, with sellers, right? Um, there's never a really bad time to list your property. I mean, I, I, I would say that uh, the best time to list your property is probably during the off seasons, like the, the off peak season, you know, when there's less inventory on the market, if your home is a quality home and it stands out and it shows well, um, there's real, no bad time, you know, the, 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 but if your home needs a little bit of work and you decide to wait until the spring market, when everybody else is waiting for the spring market to happen, then you're going to be faced with a lot of competition. You know, in terms of on, on, on the flip side for buyers, um, now is a great time to be out there looking for properties because there's, there, there, even though the inventory is still low, um, there are still good opportunities out there. Less and, people out there looking, right? And there's less people out there looking. Exactly. Um, you know, Mark, let me ask you a question. Six, seven weeks ago, even eight, eight weeks ago, were you putting in offers full of conditions? Were you putting in offers full of financing, inspection, uh, insurance, buyer's lawyer's review? Were you putting in conditions like that? Absolutely offers not. It, okay. was, it was almost impossible to, to lock down a property for a buyer with conditions like that. But I see where you're and, going with it. Now it's changed. And, now you and can now put it's in that. Changed. And now it's changed. Now you're given the opportunity to walk away, right? Buyers are given the opportunity to walk away. We're in, we're in from January or even pre-January, I would say from from mid last year to, to March of this year, that just, you, you weren't given an opportunity. You had to go in with, with a firm offer, with a clean offer. And there was ways that, you know, and you were competing nine out of 10 times you were competing on properties. So speaking know? of the way it was before, let's pause the COVID talk for a second and how it's affecting the market. You've been in the, in the industry for quite a few years. So you were there for, let's say, call it the Ottawa hype when, when, the, when the industry and the market in Ottawa started to kind of boom 
Um, do you remember when that was? Yeah, Roughly? I mean, I, I can I can give you an idea that probably happened in sometime mid two thousand and seventeen when we started to see properties go into multiple offers. So how did uh, how was that? How were people taking that? Like, how did it progress to the point where it was before COVID, which was absolutely nuts. Well, I, I think what I, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to really tell. Uh, I mean, I, I really believe it truly comes back down to just a strict rule of supply and demand. I mean, when you have less supply and the demand continues to increase for properties that you're going to have a hard time locking down properties for your buyers. Uh, that's just, that's just the reality of the market. Right. And we see waves, we see waves like this happen all the time. You know, the, the, I, I, I wasn't around for the, the, the last time that we saw the market dip like this um, back in 2008. But, you know, I, I, when I talk to people, they, they you know, uh, agents who were, they, 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 have, they say that there are a lot of the same similarities of, of, of how that was back in 2008, where, you know, it was a previously a pretty hot market. And then, you know, it, 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 it slowed right down. So, and you know, we're seeing this, I mean, we're seeing this, we did, we did 18 sales in, in the month of, of, of March and, and now in April, I think we've done seven or eight deals in the month of April. So, you know, we're down, we're down 50, 60% in, in our, in our sales. And, and it doesn't, it's not to say that we're not putting in the work and putting in the time and putting in the hours. It's just, it, it's just a reflection of the current market. So back to your, back to your buyers, is, your, is it a good opportunity for buyers? Absolutely. It's a great opportunity for buyers. Um, have we seen a real significant impact on uh, list prices? I would say no. I would say what we have seen is the strategy at which we are listing properties. That has changed. You know, pre-COVID, you know, we're, as, a, as an example, you know, we may have been listing townhomes on average for about $400,000. That hasn't changed, but our strategy in terms of what we were doing to generate multiple offers, that has changed. You want to so, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, pre-COVID, we were, there wasn't a property that we didn't put up on the market where we weren't holding off on offers. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you, we put a property live on a Thursday, uh, you, were, you were saying no conveyance of offers until uh, the following Monday at 6 p.m. You know, which gave us an opportunity to market the property over the weekend, do a couple open houses, drive a much, drive as many buyers through the property as, as we possibly could, and, and create a bidding and, war. Create a bidding war, and even create uh, the opportunity for us to um, bring the buyer through through our own marketing. Yeah. Right. Uh, and and that's so that's so extremely important. Uh, you know, people have a have a tendency to be worried about multiple representation and, uh, and what that looks like. Um, and, and they're, and they're fearful of that. But at the end of the day, if, if you're, if you're a, a reliable, trustworthy agent, um, you shouldn't have any of those conflicts arise. So, um, that's what I'd say right now for, for buyers. I think it's still a really good opportunity to get out there and, and find the right property. There is, uh, there is a, a, a shortage of inventory right now. So that could be a little bit of a challenge for buyers right now. Um, but nonetheless, you're still going to be able to get out and get properties for maybe under asking price or maybe at asking price instead of paying, you know, 30, 40, $50,000 above the asking price. Yeah. So, um, that is, uh, I think that's that I think that's extremely important for, for, for buyers right now to to understand. Yes, if you if you are struggling financially, it's not the right time for you to be buying. But if you have secure employment and you are getting a salary that's being paid to you and nothing's disrupted in your life and you are looking for an opportunity, now is a great opportunity. Absolutely. And that's the thing, like I obviously the whole Canadian economy is going to get affected by this. But I feel like here in Ottawa, because we're such a government worker, like there's a lot of government workers in the city that are still getting paid or have the ability to work from home and still get paid. Um, I don't think that, I mean, obviously the market's going to get affected, but I don't think we're going to see a huge, huge dip um, in, in terms of like 
the the real estate industry in Ottawa. I, I agree. I 100% full heartedly agree with that statement. Um, we're 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 a government city. Um, we have a lot of uh, secure employment, um, and I think that you know there's going to be opportunities for people with with buying power uh, when this whole pandemic clears up and things start to resume back to the normal day to day. There's still going to be a, a good opportunity for people there because I think that what I see happening and in in my conversations with sellers right now is I'm always trying to talk them off the fence. They want to wait, they want to wait, they want to wait. It's not a good time, it's not a good time. The pandemic, the pandemic. Now, here's, the, here's where it gets a little tricky, right? Because you have to reassure people that, yeah, you understand their point of view, but there's a reason why they're talking to you. There's a reason why they are asking you for your advice, they're asking you for your opinion. Um, you know, if you, if you just tell them, yes, it's a good time to put your home on the market without, telling them why uh, I mean you, you might as well just hang up the phone right you might as well just turn off the video because it's not it's not telling them anything um, but if you explain to them that there's a, it's a it's a great opportunity for sellers right now there's less inventory out there that they're only serious buyers that are currently out there people who need to buy right and they are still seeing not on every property but we're still seeing properties go into multiple offers so you know, it's it, it, it's very doable with the right strategies in place. And, exactly. You know, we've, we've implemented a couple of new st- strategies. You know, we've re- we've reduced our uh, our showing times on all of our listings to a half an hour max. Um, you know, we've given very strict instructions to our sellers in order to set up sanitizing stations for the buyers coming through the property. Uh, you know, we're telling the sellers as well: leave all your lights on. Uh, leave all your closet doors open so that people aren't touching anything in the home. And I think that's important. I mean, you need to, you need to, you need to protect yourself and and protect your loved ones and protect your family. Um, But there's still a really good opportunity for both, for both buyers and sellers right now. For sure. Exactly. And like we were even talking about earlier, there's the technology in the industry is advancing like 3d virtual tours. Like we're seeing that on almost every single listing now. Exactly. So that's something that we implemented a, a few, a few weeks back, uh, or probably about a month and a half ago now. Yeah. Probably about a month and a half ago now is we've done that on every single one of our listings. So we do a 3d Matterport, uh, virtual tour through the home. So it's, and it's, it, it's a really, really cool, uh, tool to use because you can you can really get an idea of the house and the footprint and the layout without having to walk through it. You know, exactly. and, and that's and been our that's been our directives to in, in each and every one of our listings is take a look at this 3D walkthrough. And if you are still interested, okay, are you experiencing any symptoms? No. When do you need to buy? What kind of closing are you looking for? What kind right? Are you are you pre-qualified? have you talked to the banks yet? Have you talked to a broker? Like you have to do your due diligence in this market to make sure that people are staying safe and staying protected. But if you do your due diligence, then you're also not wasting anybody's time. You're not wasting your exactly. time as an agent and you're not wasting your seller's time. And the seller appreciates that because the, the 3d virtual tour allows you to filter out buyers that, you know, like, let's be honest, a lot of the times, especially in real estate pictures don't really, the, the homes don't really look like the pictures, you know, the pictures do it justice, but once they actually step foot in the property, it's a completely different, it's a completely different feel and look. And I find the 3d virtual tour is a good way to kind of make it more realistic so that you can filter out buyers that, that wouldn't actually like the property once they walk into it. So it's, that's good. It's a good point for your sellers as well. So, so they, they feel more safe and stuff like that. They have to, they have to. I mean, they, they're, they're, you're, you're, you're essentially gambling with the biggest investment of their life yeah. during, during a pandemic event. So, you know, you, we've changed, we've changed a lot of ways that we do business. Like I, I am a big believer in like, I don't sell any home to anyone or for anyone unless it's the way I would want my home sold. Right. So I always put myself in the seller's shoes and try to, and try to walk myself through what they're experiencing and why they're doing the things that they're doing and why they have their home on the market. And you have to, you have to show empathy and you have to, uh, you have to, you have to walk 
in their shoes. Absolutely. Um, I'm a big believer on, as you know, on, on communication. Um, I, I, I like to, I like to be in constant communication with, with my clients. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we do uh, to make sure that they're in the know every single step of the way. Awesome. So how, let's, let me ask you this. How long do you think this whole pandemic is going to last? And how do you think the real estate market is going to bounce back from this? If you do think it's going to bounce back from this. Okay. So for your first question, your first question is how long do I think that this is going to last? It's kind of a silly question, Mark, because if I had a crystal ball to be able to tell you when this was going, how long this was going to last for, um, we wouldn't need us in the industry. What I can tell you is that things are slowly coming back to normal. Um, three, four weeks ago, I would tell you, or even six, seven weeks ago, things were, uh, people were really, scared. People were scared. You know, like I was scared. I went to, I went to pick up my kids from daycare and they said, you're not coming back. Um, but then we got a message from the schools after that my daughter wasn't allowed back to school. And you know, like that's, that's, that's stressful. Like, uh, anybody with kids at home right now, I, 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 I feel, I feel for those people. I'm, I'm walking, I'm there with them. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really stressful. Uh, you know, we've got a, we've got, uh, as you know, we've got a builder that we're, we're working with now very, very closely and, and we're, we do all of their homes for them. And, and, um, they had, uh, they had a pretty, they had a, they had a big scare for them too, because, you know, we had, we had 12 of their townhomes, uh, you know, eight, of, eight of the 12 of the townhomes that we had listed or were going to list for them. We had them pre-sold essentially. And we were just waiting for a couple other details to roll in. And then, you know, then COVID happened and we, we lost six of those buyers. We lost six of those opportunities. Um, then they got hit with more bad news that all of their materials and all the plants that produced their materials were all shutting down. Yeah. So, and then they got more bad news and then they got bad news about not being able to pull permits for new construction. And then, you know, so they, it, it, it just, it got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. But what I can tell you is things start, are starting to be on the rebound. We are starting to see plants reopen. We are starting to see the materials start to be producing again. But then again, people are asking me, um, well, when, when are we going to be able to close our new construction? I have no idea, right? If we get a setback uh, and the plants need to reclose again, if there's a second wave of this virus that comes through and starts affecting the population again, then there's going to be more setbacks. But, you know, I'm paying very, very close attention to um, the new cases that are, that are coming to within the region on a daily basis. And things do seem to be stabilizing, um, you know. So I, I'm hopeful that we will be able to resume. Uh, it will never be business as usual. Like people are saying, oh, it's going to go back to business as usual. I don't think it will ever be business as usual, probably for another year to year and a half. I don't see it. I, I, I just don't. Um, but... I, I do think that we will be able to move forward and and still be able to run our day to day uh, in an effective way and and still be able to produce and still be able to you know get homes on the market get homes back off the market um, you know we're starting to see people do virtual open houses yeah uh, that's something that I've I've started to look into a little bit I'm not a huge advocate of them for a number of different reasons. I believe that, you know, when you have buyers coming to you at an open house, it's a great opportunity. Like I did a lot of my business uh, when I first got into the industry through open houses um, because you, you, you have people come to you. Um, that is, you know, doing a virtual open house, you still don't have anybody coming to you. So how effective can they really be? Yeah. You know? And the point, and here, I want to just make, make one more point. The point of an open house is not necessarily your first priority is to sell the home, but it's, you know, uh, less than, I would say less than 2% of the time you're going to actually sell the home at an open house. Uh, but it is to 
going back to what I was initially, what we initially were talking about in building your pipeline and prospecting, it is about qualifying the people that are coming through the open house and figuring out what their timeline is and how you can help them and how you can serve them and how you can provide them value. Right. So there was a huge opportunity for business there, which we have now lost because doing a virtual open house is in my opinion right now, I haven't done too, too much research into it. I just don't see how it would, uh, it would benefit anyone in any way. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. So do you think that once this is all said and done, the real estate market will go back to being as hot as it was or even exceed it or. That's a, that's a, that's a tough question to, to, to answer, to be honest with you. I think that that's going to be one of those things that you're going to need to monitor day by day, week by week, month by month, uh, and follow the trends. Um, if, if it's trending back towards the seller's market, fantastic. I think, I think, I honestly, this, I, this is what I think. I think that when this is, when, when they say, okay, we can start to resume uh, business as usual, so they say, or they start to lift restrictions, I think we're going to see a flood in the market. I think we're going to see a flooding of inventory come onto the market because people will be like, okay, now it's safe for me to list my home. Yeah. And I think that is going to, uh, I don't know if the demand is going to be as, as high as the actual supply that we're going to have on the market at that given time. And I think it'll take time for that months of inventory to reduce back to a point where we were at Christmas uh, or in January where we only had a month of inventory on the market. Yep. Cool. So I'm going to hit you with five quick questions. I want quick answers to these. Um, and then I'll let you go because I know you got a lot to do today. So first question, what's the first thing you're doing when the pandemic COVID-19 is over mm -hmm. and you can leave and go wherever you want freely? Well, I've had, okay, quick question. It's not a quick answer, but a quick, I'll try to make it quick as quickly as I'll try to make it quick. So I, I've had two fishing trips canceled. So I'm going to be re rebooking those and getting on the water and throwing a line in the water. And then I'm going to throw a huge bash and throw a huge party. Love you know, it. it's, it, I, I, I'm, I love my friends. I love my family. Uh, I have a very tight group of friends. Uh, and, and this is, this has been hard on all of us not being able to see each other. So I'm going to throw a party and I'm going to go fishing. Love it. What's one thing that you took for granted pre COVID-19 that now you realize how grateful you are to, to have been able to have or do? Uh, I think it's the, I think it's right along the same lines as the first question. It's a, it's family, it's friends. It's, uh, it's being able to be social. It's being able to get out and, uh, and talk to people. It's being able to go, go downtown and go out for, uh, go out for a bite with, with my wife and, uh, or go out for some drinks with some friends. It's, 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 it's we take for granted the social aspect of life. And for me, that is, that's absolutely huge. I, I, I have, uh, I've had the same group of friends, some of them for, you know, 30 years. And, uh, this is, this has been, this has been, uh, this has been tough, man. It's been tough. So I, I think that the, yeah, that's family, family, friends don't take any of them for granted. Cool. So where do you see Matt Gibbs in 10 years? Oh, where do I see myself in 10 years? In 10 years, 10 years, I'll be almost 50, bro. Wow. Damn. That Damn. sucks. In 10 years, I will be almost 50. So by that time, I hope to, I, I really hope to have uh, accomplished everything that I want to in terms of uh, my real estate goals. Uh, I hope that, uh, I, I hope that my, my, my family is, is, is still healthy. Um, but you know, I, I want to, in 10 years, I want to start enjoying more of life. I want to start pumping the brakes. I want to start traveling more, something that I did a lot before I had kids. Um, I want, I, so that's where I would, I would hope that I would be in, in the next 10 years or so. It's a good answer, man. Um, okay, question number four. What legacy do you want to leave behind when all is said and done? Legacy. I'm not big on what do you want people to, what do you want people to remember Matt Gibbs as? 
just a just a just a hard worker, a hard worker, and a, and, and, a, and I put everything into I put everything into this. Um, I put everything, every ounce of me that I have into this. But I also do, I don't want people just to remember me for that. I want them to uh, remember how much of an asshole I was. Uh, I want them to remember the good times. I want them to remember um, the jokes. Uh, I, I just want to remember it as a fun loving guy that lived every, every last minute to the fullest. Awesome. But, you know, that's it. Last question. Where can people find you? Where can people follow you? People can find me. I got to do a better job of this, but people can find me on Facebook, Instagram. They can find our team on Facebook and in Instagram and in Twitter. Uh, they can find us at our website at, uh, Mayhew-Gibbs.ca. Uh, they can find us at our new brokerage, Century 21 Synergy.ca, our new venture that we started this year, where we've got 30 agents, 30 agents now on board. It's something that I never envisioned would ever happen to us, but I'm happy that we're finally there. Yeah, I think we're going to need to bring you on in the future for another episode on that aspect of starting a brokerage and how that's changed your life and everything. Absolutely, buddy. It would be my pleasure. I'm, I'm glad we got to sit down and do this. I think we should do this more. Likewise, man. Well, listen, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for jumping on. Leading gentlemen, Matt Gibbs. Take it easy. Peace.